For those of you who have just finished studying the Gospel of Mark with Anne on Wednesday mornings or here on Sunday mornings, you know that it reads like an action-packed thriller, punctuated with words like immediately, as soon as, or now. From the moment that Jesus began his ministry, he was constantly on the move from one place to the next, and wherever he went, a crowd followed him. There were those in the crowd who were attracted to Jesus, mostly because of all the miracles that they had seen him perform or heard about him performing. And then there were those others lurking in the crowd whose hearts and minds were filled with a mixture of wonder and jealousy and even suspicion people who felt threatened by Jesus' ministry. We see this in our gospel lesson this morning. Jesus has just returned home from a very busy day. He's cast out demons, he's healed Peter's mother-in-law, and he's done a lot of preaching of the message which he was sent to proclaim. The very first words he ever spoke in public, repent and believe The kingdom of God has come near. So again, word has gotten out and the crowds have once again shown up, including the Pharisees and the scribes, hoping this will be a chance to publicly discredit Jesus. So listen to what happens next. One day while he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting nearby. They had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. Just then, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a bed. They were trying to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Then the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, who is this who is speaking blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their questionings, he answered them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins are forgiven you or to say stand up and walk, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the one who was paralyzed, I say to you, stand up, take up your bed and go home. Immediately, the man stood up before them, took what he had been lying on, and went to his home, glorifying God. Amazement seized all of them, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen strange things today. We can hear that sense of urgency in this story. Four friends carrying the weight of their friend's illness, desperately pushing their way through the crowds to bring him to the man who has the power to heal him of his disease, liberating him from being a burden to his family and his friends, enabling him to live a fuller life outside the confines of his home. Only their attempt ends in frustration. They can't get anywhere near the front door. Their backs aching, their arms burning from carrying the weight of the stretcher. We might imagine the paralytic coaxing them, just put me down. He's touched by his friend's persistence, yet it all seems so pointless. But they refuse to give up. There has to be some way they can get him to Jesus. These four friends were on an urgent mission. 
and they were going to get it done. All of a sudden, one of them comes up with a really crazy idea. What about the roof? And hearing him, the paralytic is incredulous, most likely even a tad afraid that their stamina will give way and he'll be dropped to the ground below. But the four friends know that the only hope for that young man's healing is in that house. So before he can protest any further, they hoist the stretcher up onto the roof and they begin clawing their way with their bare hands, their desperation becoming brute strength. And we can only begin to imagine what the guests thought as dirt and mud and straw began to rain down upon them. Was the roof about to collapse? And with so many people packed into this house, how would we ever escape if it did? But before total panic can set in, they see this man being lowered. Some are merely stunned silent. Others rush and gr to reach up and grab the stretcher, helping to keep it steady as it's lowered. And in the center of all the action, there stands Jesus, watching perhaps with a knowing smile on his face. <clears throat> his heart is moved by such determination, such commitment, such love for a friend, and such faith. So Jesus says, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Now, probably what wasn't the miracle that they were expecting or hoping for. Yet, they were raised to believe that physical illness was caused by sin and that a disability you had from birth, like blindness or in this case paralysis, was caused by your parents' sin. But this isn't the moment to correct their theology. Jesus will do that later in a very long back and forth with the Pharisees about the man born blind. For now, Jesus is proclaiming in word and in deed his true identity and the true urgency of his mission. He is not just another prophet through whom God will work miracles like the prophets of old. This miraculous healing is meant to be a visible sign, an epiphany, if you will, that Jesus is the Messiah, through whom the kingdom of God is already becoming a reality here on earth. And for those who enter that kingdom by faith, the old life is gone, and a new life has begun. And again, we see a mixture of reactions. The Pharisees, the good religious folks, murmuring that he's committing blasphemy. But the crowds, the crowds shout with amazement. We have never seen anything like this. They, unlike those scribes and Pharisees, were able to see the true measure of our faith in the desperate actions of those four friends who did everything in their power to make sure that their friend had an encounter with Jesus, an encounter that brought him the gift of new life. As a community of faith, we see in those stretcher bearers an invitation, maybe even a challenge, to sense the urgency of our mission to bring people into an encounter with Christ and to persist in that mission, even in those moments when it all seems pointless to claw our way through any obstacles that seek to distract us or to deter us from that mission. 
and to use all our God-given creativity and our spirit-endowed ingenuity to try even what at first sounds like the craziest of ideas so that others will see our amazing faith and say, we have never seen anything like this. I started thinking about this sermon at the beginning at, uh, of the week when I was at home waiting for my landlord to come to meet some repairmen. My landlord, who's about 30, showed up with his two-year-old daughter. And typically, he's really quiet, but not this time. He wasn't in the door five minutes when he began to tell me with great excitement in his voice about a new ministry he and his friends are thinking about starting here in town. A ministry that would be housed in the community that would be shared by all the churches in Camp Hill. That as he said, quote, will bring the gospel to people his age outside the church world walls, close quote. I'm not going to say much about it because it's not my place since it's only in its formative stage as a great idea. Suffice it to say, it's a ministry of which I'm well familiar and have seen it work well in other places. But that's beside the point. The point is how energized, how excited my young landlord was as he spoke about the need to do something we've never seen before, to minister to the unchurched. And his enthusiasm was contagious because then the two repair guys show up and they're overhearing our conversation and they decide to join in and I'm like, there's a mini revival happening <laughs> in my living room and I need to get to church, by the way. Ah, God. And his enthusiasm was rooted in reality because he grew up in the church. He knows the challenges and the potential obstacles. And he, like many of us, long for what's next to be rooted and grounded in what was. Again, his words, quote, how scary it is to think that God is allowing the church to deconstruct in this time of reformation. But also his words, how excited I am to think I could be part of some whole new way of being church. I've heard that same enthusiasm and I've witnessed that same amazing faith here among us. So my prayer is that we would be like those four stretcher bearers, that we would persist together in our urgent mission to bring a life-changing encounter with the one who only, the only one who has the power to heal and forgive those in need of it, to claw our way, to persist, and to sense that we are in this together because there were four stretcher bearers. May God give us the courage, the enthusiasm, and the contagious amazement to do so. Amen.